Hey, Grace family, it's me, Teresa Blackman. I just wanted to reach out and share that my revelation during this pandemic has been the importance of slowing down. Um, it has been an absolute blessing to be home with my kids, spend some just quality time with them while they're so little. Um, we've had lots of family giggles and laughs. Um, it's just, it's been a blessing to have them, to prioritize them and not worry about the drama and the outside world, all of the things. If I had more time, I would, I would, I would. I've got plenty of time and I am so thankful that I'm able to just focus on my kids and truly slow down. Hi, my name is Jana Wiggins, and a few weeks ago, my husband and I saw on the Grace Athens Instagram story that the COVID city relief effort for that week was going to go toward the Athens Community Council on Aging. And we had really been looking for a way to give back during this time of quarantine, and so we jumped right on it, and on a Monday night, we put something on our neighborhood Facebook page that we would be doing a drive for supplies for senior citizens in the Athens area that week. And by Friday morning, our generous neighbors had loaded up our front porch with donated items items we filled up a truck and it was really easy and we're just grateful to Grace Athens for giving us an opportunity that would make it easy for us to get back Colossians 4 2 says to devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful at 8 o'clock every morning during the pandemic a group of strangers who have since then become friends have gathered on Zoom to pray for our church, our nation, our healthcare workers, first responders, teachers, students, the elderly, and any other needs that have come our way. We have let the Holy Spirit lead us in this time of prayer. We were and continue to be watchful and thankful. Hey, I'm Denise Cox, and my husband Doug and I have lived in our home for about 20 years. And throughout our marriage, we have seen so many times that God will give something to us in order to give it through us. So right at the beginning of this pandemic, when grocery shelves were bare and food was a little bit tricky to come by, one of our neighbors received an accidental huge Instacart delivery, which she assumed should have been to my house instead of her house since we have lots of kids, but actually we hadn't ordered anything. So she wanted to bring all of the food here and we told her, no, please don't, because we know of a single mom with four kids who really, really could use the food. So she took all of those groceries over to our friend's house. And while she was there, she realized there were a few more things that family needed. So she headed back to the grocery store and got more things for that family. And she surprised us with an entire counter full of groceries as well, which we just couldn't believe her kindness and generosity. But what I love is how God takes sometimes what is little and just multiplies it, right? So last night, we um, got a text from a friend who said um, that she put a box of vegetables and fruits in our driveway and that it was too heavy to bring to our door. And we were like, okay, what's in this box that she couldn't carry it to the door? And oh my goodness, it was just overflowing with so many fruits and vegetables. So once again, we felt like God was telling us to give it away. So we were able to give a bunch to one of our other neighbors and also to our single mom friend again. And it's just um, so cool to see how often God gives something to us in order to give it through us. The Grace Athens family group has meant a lot to Lindsay and I, uh, just being new to Athens and um, being in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, this group has allowed us to connect and grow uh, and just commune with other families uh, in this new city. And it's meant a lot to be able to partner with them. Like the family group has just been a tangible reminder to us of God's provision that um, in a new place with a lot of other stuff going on, he's just been faithful to give us community, even when it looks different. 
Hi, my name is Heather Leo, and I'm the Kids Director here at Grace New Hope in Lawrenceville. I'm Jack Leo. I'm a senior at Providence Christian Academy, and I'm currently in True North at Grace New Hope as well. And we were looking for a way to serve when quarantine started, and I was talking to the director of the Southeast Gwinnett Co-op Ministry here in Grayson, and she was telling me that her volunteers were tired and they needed reinforcements. So we joined a group from our church that began serving there, and it was great to be able to load groceries and toiletries and toilet paper and all the things they needed into the cars. Um, there were hundreds of cars, hundreds, and we were just overwhelmed um, by the need, but we were grateful to be able to serve. It was just really awesome to be able to give back to my community and serve, you know, where I was needed and uh, just be able to have something to do as well um, in this time. So, yeah, it was a great experience. Hey, Grace family, Melissa Rogers here from Marietta. I have loved seeing God at work in our community during this unprecedented time. I've enjoyed being a part of and seeing our Marietta community come together and support our weekly outreach. We have partnered with our local YMCA to create blessing bags that are taken to the extended stay hotels around the corner from us. We've also partnered with Righteous Q, a local barbecue restaurant, and we fed our local firefighters in our community. And lastly, we have supported this amazing organization called The Table on Delk, and we've provided sack lunches for their Psalm 34-8 sack lunch distribution for women and children living in local motels on that street. I am super thankful, and I know we are super thankful to have had this time to build these relationships with these organizations and partner with them, and we plan to serve them all summer long. Hi, I'm Camille, and I go to Grace Midtown. The last few months have been pretty challenging for me. I lost my job toward the beginning of the pandemic and was denied unemployment, so I didn't have any income. I didn't know how I was going to be able to pay my rent. Started experiencing um, some anxiety about that and was praying and I felt the Holy Spirit ask, do you believe that I see you? Do you believe that I am good? Do you believe that I provide for my children? So I started pressing into that interceding, asking the Lord to meet me in this need and also to provide the faith for me to trust him with it. A few days later, a member of my house church felt led to trust God with their finances and generosity and gave money to our house church leaders to distribute among people in our house church that were experiencing financial need. The amount that was given to me was the exact amount of the dollar that I was praying for. And it covered not just my immediate rent and utilities, but paid all of my living expenses through the remainder of my lease. Um, I'm so completely blown away by the generosity of the church and the love of the Father. So thank you, church, for the way that you come alongside us. The Lord can take so many different pieces and bring them together and glue them together and make this beautiful story. I remember Sheba had sent out um, the email that if you want to drop off food. And so I emailed uh, Pastor Randy and he replied back and said, well, yeah, uh, we're accepting food, um, but is there anything else that we can do to help uh, the VA? The first thing on our list were masks. We need masks. Denise, you started telling Randy about what you all were doing at Piece of Thread. We'd been in Clarkston all day um, looking for material at our center there and that we could possibly make some masks with, some more masks. So there was a need and then uh, there were people, women, waiting to meet that need. It took us three days, to 10 hour, 12 hour days to cut those masks. New Hope was gonna cover the cost of all the masks. And we've had so many requests from people asking, how can we help, where can we be generous? And yeah. someone actually donated their whole stimulus check to cover the cost of the masks. Here you have refugee women, many of whom have fled oppression. And these veterans, many of whom who have gone and risked their lives, not just for freedom here, but for freedom in other places. I'm just so thankful to the Lord that he put all this together. It's a great moment. This is Matt Reynolds with the Grace Family of Churches. And although we recorded our Pentecost service earlier this week, we really felt that after the last few days, the 
senseless death of George Floyd, we had to do something and to start this service with a time of lament. Um, Pentecost is about the spirit being poured out and uniting humanity, and it's about God's restorative justice. And if you've seen this video, if you've read the story, it's just so far from what God's kingdom looks like. There's a lot of brokenness and there's a lot of pain right now in the Christian community. There's a lot of pain in our brothers and sisters of color's hearts because this injustice has happened over and over again and there's just a burden. There's a weariness. So we want to enter into that pain. We want to create space for time to lament. For Pentecost to truly mean something, it means we look at the places where the work of God's Spirit is not present where we say this is not what it's supposed to look like this is not the way of the kingdom and these are the places that we're asking for god's spirit to work these are the very places we're asking for restorative justice to happen for god's spirit to be poured out on all flesh uh, young old black white men women every tribe every nation every tongue so we'd love to i'd love to just read a prayer that we found uh, that ministered to us and it's a prayer of acknowledgement and Lament by Elizabeth Behrens. I'd love to read this, and then we're just gonna create some space, have the prayer um, so you can read it, and just to grieve, to let your heart feel what it feels. Um, maybe you need to repent as you hear these words. Maybe you're convicted um, in your heart about the bias you have, and we'd love to enter in to some repentance um, to usher in this day of Pentecost. Lord, as we become aware of the intensity of the racial divide, our hearts are broken. Help us not to rush from this place of hurting to triumphalism or repair, but rather lament as you call us to do. May our lament be a form of worship, a joining of our hearts with yours as we grieve the lack of your kingdom justice here on earth. Strengthen us for this path as without you, the overwhelming depth of problems that must be addressed and acknowledged would be devastating. We know that you mourn with us and comfort us as we mourn with one another. In Christ's holy name, amen. So again, as we've processed this, another death, as we've seen these videos, as we've read um, these stories, our hearts are broken. We'd love to create a moment. We're gonna put this prayer up on the screen and then we'll start the gathering in a few minutes. God's people gathered around God's word, led by God's spirit. We want to stay focused on our mission. And that is to see people become awake to God. We want to see disciples made. We want to see house churches planted and flourished. And we want to see new churches uh, be birthed, be planted. My name is Matt Reynolds. We want to welcome you, Grace family, to this 2020 Pentecost experience. My name is Erin Puckett, and I just want to say a special hello to all the families and kids joining us. And Jude's here with us as well, and he's going to be representing the kids. 
So first we want to talk about what is Pentecost. It actually means 50 and it's 50 days after the resurrection. And we see in Acts that Jesus gave a special promise. He was appearing to his disciples after the resurrection and he gave them a really specific command. He said, stay in Jerusalem in Acts 1-4. Don't leave until you receive the gift that my father promised. Verse 8 talks about the gift and he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And it was that power that birthed the church 2,000 years ago that we're still a part of today. And what I love so much about Pentecost is that we had not just men or people from one area, families, men, women, children, and people from all over represented that day. What I love even more is that when the Holy Spirit fell, it didn't just fall on one person or a small group of people, it was for everyone, kids included. And what were we supposed to do? The question I wanted to know is, what were we supposed to do with the Holy Spirit? And we can find it here in Acts 1.8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. What is a witness? You might be wondering that because I wondered it too. A witness is somebody who sees something and hears something. This week I witnessed a bee pollinating a flower. I told so many people about it because it was so cool. And that's kind of what a witness is, right? They see and hear yeah. something and then they tell other people about that experience. That's what a witness does. Yeah, so the Holy Spirit comes in our life and it renews us and then we get to tell people about the thing that God's doing in us. Isn't that right, Jude? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Right. So we're excited to see what the work of the Spirit wants to do in your life and in your family and in those that you're gathered with today and to see where he's going to take us all as a family of churches. So we're going to start off with some worship, right, Jude? So you can go ahead and stand up right where you are. We want you to engage in this uh, with us. And the first song, Jude, tell them about what the first song the is. The first song, um, kids can sing too with hand motions, and it's called The Way. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress Oh, and you are my portion You are my hiding place, yeah I believe you are the way The truth And the life
Trusting in my own strength is not the way, it's not the way, it's not the way Trusting in money is not the way, it's not the way, it's not the way Trusting in my own plans for my future is not the way, it's not the way, it's not the way I will trust in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord I will trust in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord I will trust in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Oh, and even when it's hard, oh, I will trust in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Oh, even when I'm afraid, I will trust. I Here 
Yeah, we hear the sound, Lord. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. The Grace Family of Churches exists to cultivate a movement of healthy churches that raises up next generation leaders, plants churches, and catalyzes Jesus movements in the Muslim world. Our goal today is to raise $150,000 towards this shared mission. Last year, you graciously gave $70,000, which kickstarted the foundation and was seed money for new churches that we want to plant. We're so grateful for that partnership and we want to give you some highlights of what happened over this last year across the family of churches. When you come to the Grace Residency, really what we want to do is help you gain both expertise and experience. And it's actually these two things together that hopefully help you leave the residency more prepared for the life of work, ministry, and calling that God has placed on you. I um, work doing one-on-ones with college students, training some of the leaders, um, the house church leaders. Plan a lot of our outward facing events, plan a lot of worship nights. I've gotten a lot of tools that I can walk with whether I do ministry or not. There's so many practical things that we learn as far as from leadership to rest and work. I would recommend this program to anyone who um, is thinking about going into ministry but doesn't know exactly what that looks like for them. I think that this program can be formative for your entire life, that you'll always like look back and say like, man, there were so many things I learned about myself and so many things that redefine the course of my life. Hey Grace family, it's Ben Hardman from Grace Marietta. I want to give you just a quick update on all the things that God is doing here in Marietta and all the ways that he's working. The church has been growing like crazy. There's been a lot of really fun things. Uh, about a year ago, we moved to self-sufficiency. Our church has just been so amazingly and abundantly generous. It's been so beautiful to see. We're also really thinking about church planting. Uh, our, our community has a real passion for Chattanooga. They've been praying into what would it look like for us to partner with a church plant uh, in Chattanooga. And so moving from being children to being parents is part of our vision. Hey guys, my name's Chris Mormon. I'm the lead pastor of Grace Capital City here in Washington, D.C. We were launched out um, by the Grace family of churches um, about nearly five years ago now. God's been good to us. The church grew over the first couple of years. The vision God's given us is, is bigger than just one location. And so we've been praying into planting church. And so specifically, we've identified some of the areas of Northern Virginia. There's a, a church location we think we can plant. These things wouldn't be possible, again, without the family. It wouldn't be possible for us to grow, to have vision, to not just survive, but to actually thrive and go beyond um, where we currently are. Many of you probably have already heard that we've been in the process of planting a church here in the Lanier area for some time. Right now, we are standing right off of Buford Dam Road, the location where we have been gathering every Sunday evening since January. And this community has really begun to take on some momentum as some of our seasoned Grace families, some new young couples have come together. And we're excited to talk about how we see this moving forward. At Grace Snellville, we are really eager to be sort of a mother church for this Lanier community helping to get it off the ground so that initially it can be an extension, a campus of Grace Snellville. We see the Buddy Hoffman Foundation coming alongside in sort of like a father role to help coach, lead, and provide structure. Now the momentum here at Lanier has been developed in no small part because of the contribution of the man to my right, Lee Lopez. And we're really excited that this summer, Lee is going to be transitioning into a new position 
called The Fellowship in partnership with the Buddy Hoffman Foundation so that he can step into a developmental year, bridging him from where he and Savannah are now to being fully fledged planters 12 to 18 months from now. Before the pandemic hit, uh, we had a lot of growth, momentum, God was adding to our numbers. But after COVID-19 came about, we thought that this momentum was gonna stop. But God slowly but surely began to open up our eyes and show us that even in the middle of this outbreak, He wanted to bring breakthrough. We went from this mentality of wanting to become a church to being the church. And we started to mobilize. We started to make masks and give it out to the community. We started collecting non-perishables. We collected and brought 30, 40, 50 meals here each week. We've seen such amazing work of God in this community. And it's been my pleasure and my honor to serve alongside these families who have sacrificially and selflessly served this community. Yeah, so it's been an exciting year for Grace Lanier and an exciting year for the Grace family of churches. This year already, we have Grace Capital City and Grace Marietta, which have become self-sufficient. This is a huge move for the family. They're also thinking about uh, planning other churches in the near future. We've had 20 residents go through the residency and launch out from the residency for the first time. And uh, this year we've seen Lanier take a huge step forward in becoming a campus of Snellville and then eventually a church plant. It has been uh, an exciting thing to see God move this year, but the best is still yet to come. So I want to pitch to Matt Reynolds right now who's going to be talk, talk to you about what's going to be happening this next year through the Grace Family of Churches. Our goal of this Pentecost is to raise $150,000 towards our shared mission. We don't want this gift to replace your local giving. We really want this to be an above and beyond gift to further the mission of the family. I want to explain what this $150,000 investment will be able to do though. There's a number of things that this allows us to invest in. First, it allows us to continue our residency program and invest in 20 additional next generation leaders. Secondly, it allows us to build out our fellowship program, which is tailored specifically at developing church planners. Third, it allows us to continue launching Grace Lanier, this church that we're excited about. And in addition, we wanna continue pursuing the possibility of planting in Chattanooga and in Northern Virginia as well. A couple more things. It's gonna allow us to help Grace Athens become a self-sustainable church by the end of 2021. And finally, a $150,000 investment will allow us to continue to develop partnerships with those around the world who are catalyzing Jesus movements in the Muslim world. We do not take your giving lightly, and we know we couldn't do this without you. So we are asking to really consider I'm giving to our shared mission today. I'd love to share with you the ways you can give right now towards our goal. There's gonna be a number that you can text on the screen. You can text any amount to this number and it's a very secure way to give. There's also a website that you can visit and give directly on our website. If you already have a profile through one of the Grace Churches, you can use that as well and we're so grateful um, just for your partnerships so i just love for you to think about it and let me just take a minute to address that we're not together this pentecost it's all online and we're in the midst of this covid crisis and we know for some this is a really difficult time that you're going through we've seen an outpouring of generosity locally at all of our churches and there's been so many creative ways that benevolence has been happening um, to meet the needs locally to be honest with you, we have a big vision here as a family of churches. And as we prayed about it and considered it, we felt like it was still the right thing to make this ask, to let you know what our needs are and to not stop pursuing this vision that God has given us. We don't know when this crisis is gonna pass, but we do feel conviction to stick to the mission and the vision God has given us. And so we're inviting you into that. My family and I get excited about giving towards the Pentecost goal every year. I can honestly say there hasn't been a grace initiative that we've invested in um, that we've ever had any regret around. We're always blown away by us bringing our little part to the whole what, what God can do through us. And I think the family of churches is continuing to grow and follow the future 
that God has for us. So thank you for considering investing and partnering with us financially. I'd also love to say if you have any needs locally, um, please let us know. We'd love to know how we can help you and how we can try to meet those needs in this time. Um, We're going to have a message now from Chris Mormon, and he's going to be talking about the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us individually and as families and even as whole churches. So excited about this message from Chris and excited what God's going to do in your heart through it. Well, hey, Grace family, it is such an absolute honor to be with you this Sunday, this very special Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. Um, I I believe I've spoken at pretty much all of the Grace churches at one time or another, with the exception of Grace Marietta, and that's just because Ben Hardman will not give me an invitation, and I'm not bitter about that at all, but all the others I've, I've been at, but I've never spoken to the entire Grace family at the same time. So this really is a treat. Thank you guys for having me, and especially a treat on this Sunday. It's Pentecost Sunday. This is such an important moment in the Christian calendar. This is when we remember the giving of the Holy Spirit, the the birthing of the Christian church. It's when we remember this empowered group of believers beginning to go out into the world to see God's kingdom come. And so just an honor to be able to preach to you guys uh, on Pentecost Sunday. We're going to go ahead and read some verses from Pentecost just to remind ourselves of what happened on that day. So this is Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4. If you have a Bible, why don't you go ahead and turn there. And I have to say, in the the words of our founder, the late, great Buddy Hoffman, slip up your hand if you need a Bible, as he used to say. So this is Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. In my experience, if you were raised in the church, depending on what kind of church you were raised in, it often informs what you believe about the Spirit or what your interaction is with the Holy Spirit, kind of how you approach conversations about the Holy Spirit. I know we have some people here at our church, Grace Capital City, and you know, you start talking about the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues before they were speaking English. They, they grew up in one of those, you know, like hands down for coffee churches. You know what I'm talking about? Put your hand down if you need coffee, right? And so you start talking about the Spirit with them, and they're like, yeah, come on. Like, I, I live in the river. Like, let's, let's go for it. You know, that's a lot of people um, around our family. I know for me personally, that wasn't my experience. I, I grew up in Australia, of course, but I grew up in a Dutch Reformed church which we affectionately call now the Frozen Chosen. And there were so many amazing things about that church. I am, I am deeply grateful for the, the legacy of Bible knowledge and Bible maturity that was poured into me at a young age. But if you'd had a conversation with me about like the present work of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit— you know, that would have been foreign to me. I didn't really understand that. And so I, I say that just to kind of make the point that as we talk about the Holy Spirit, we bring a lot of ourselves into the conversation, don't we? A lot of our background tends to inform how we feel about this conversation. But whatever background we come from, one thing we can all acknowledge and agree on is that at Pentecost, something shifted. Something dramatic changed at Pentecost when there were a group of believers gathered and God poured out His Spirit on all of them. There was a shift in how we approach the Spirit, in in the posture of the Holy Spirit. So I I want to press into that for a minute. What shifted at Pentecost? Now, a helpful 
way that I've found it to articulate this shift is to think of it like this. You see, before Pentecost, so in the Old Testament, I, I would say that the Spirit was with us. The Spirit was, was with us. And of course, we know that the Spirit wasn't created at Pentecost, right? Of course, that the Holy Spirit is a member of the triune, eternal God. It wasn't created at Pentecost. We read all throughout the Old Testament these moments where the Holy Spirit is ministering and, and, and moving. These moments where we read about the work of the Holy Spirit. You think about uh, the book of Genesis. It starts like that. You have the Spirit hovering over the waters. You read about uh, the book of Judges. We read about some movements of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Judges chapter 3, this man named Othniel, it talks about the Spirit coming upon him in power. Judges 6, you have Gideon. It says that before he goes out to battle the Midianites, see that the Spirit comes upon him in power. Then you have this guy Samson with the long hair and, and, the, and the big muscles, right? It talks about how the Spirit comes upon him and, and he literally tears apart a lion with his bare hands, which is graphic to say the least, right? But we, that's what we read about the Spirit, right? It seems like the Spirit in the Old Testament comes with, with a purpose. It comes to a specific person for a situation to strengthen them or speak through them or empower them in a particular moment. The Spirit is with us in the Old Testament. A helpful metaphor, I think, um, when we're thinking about this is, um, is th think about water. Think about this, this bottle of water, right? The water is with me, isn't it, right now? And because, because the water is with me, I, there's certain things I can do with it. It can help me. I could pour it all over my head. Right? I could take a shower with it. You could take a shower with it. It might be the first shower you've taken in quarantine. Right? I could splash it in my face to refresh me. Right? It can help me. I could wash my hands with it. I could, I could wash my car with it. You could wash my car with it, perhaps. Just consider that a volunteer opportunity if you're interested. But the water, the water is, is with me. It's, it's helping me. It's assisting me. The water is with me. And I think this is a, a helpful way to think about the role or the posture of the Holy Spirit pre-Pentecost. It is with us, helping us. But at Pentecost, the, the posture changes, doesn't it? You see, now, no longer is, is the water with me. Now the water is within me. And as much as the water, when it was with me, it, it helped me, right? I could clean myself. I could wash my hands. I could wash my car. It helped me. When the water is within me, it doesn't just help me. It literally transforms me. It is changing me. My body is dependent on water, right? It is, it is growing me. It's strengthening me. It's giving me energy. It's letting me live, right? It's fueling my body, this water within me, right? We, need, we know our bodies are reliant on water. We need to be hydrated. I, I had a, a Facebook post I saw once where someone posted this thing. They said, you know, if you're sick, you should get an onion, put it in a sock, and sleep with it. And, and then I had another friend, and she's, she's in the medical field, and she commented on it, and she said, you know what, just keep the onion, save the sock, just drink a lot of water. Right? And I was like, that's, that's what we know. That's what water does to our bodies. It, it, it transforms us. It grows us, strengthens us, changes us. And guys... This is, this is like the new posture of the Holy Spirit we read about at Pentecost. Because at Pentecost, what happens is no longer is the Spirit just showing up at certain moments. It's not just showing up to strengthen Gideon or to strengthen Samson or to help in a moment or to comfort someone. Now the Spirit is dwelling within the daughters and sons of Jesus Christ, sanctifying them, empowering them, transforming them to look and live more like Jesus himself. Guys, this is, this is the beautiful message of Pentecost, right? 
is that there was, there was like a, a bowl of water that we had used to splash our faces with, and God said, I want you to have a drink. That water that has been with you is now going to be within you, and it's not just going to help you. It's going to completely change you, and I, and I just want to speak this out over you, wherever you are watching this from today. If you are in Christ Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living within you right now. And the Holy Spirit is sanctifying you and challenging you and convicting you of sin and leading you into righteousness. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are available to you. The promise of Pentecost is no longer is the Spirit just with us. Now we talk about the Spirit within us. I remember when, um, when I was about 19, there was a group of some of my friends, and, and we, we all together just got, I don't know how else to describe it, we, we just got on fire for God, <laughs> like all at the same time. And we were all going to the same church, and, and so we were just hungry for the, for the things of God, and, and we were just doing anything we could to learn more, to experience more of God. And we were young and immature and naive in a lot of ways, but we were, we were hungry. And these conversations started coming out about more, like having more of God. Can you have more of the Spirit, more of God? Maybe there's more available to us. And, and we would read these passages in the Scriptures, like, like Ephesians 5, 18, where, where Paul talks about being filled with the Spirit. But then we would, we would learn that, that being filled is like being continuously filled. And we're like, yeah, you can have more of God, be continuously filled. Or Acts chapter 8, where this moment where Peter and John literally rebaptized these believers because they were baptized into the name of Jesus, but they hadn't received the Spirit. And so we were having these conversations about more. We wanted more of God. And so we were just going after it. And we would have these, these worship nights, right? And, and I know around Grace, right? If, if you are having a worship night in your house, you know, maybe someone shows up with an acoustic guitar and maybe someone shows up with a djembe or if you're getting really creative and fancy, maybe you bring a violin along. Someone's got some skills on that. But for us in Adelaide, Australia in the late 90s, our spiritual weapon of choice was the five CD disc changer, Okay. You know what I'm talking about with the five CD disc? It had the tray that came out and you could put in five discs, right? Not one, not two, not three, five discs. And I'm telling you, guys, you could program in so much, you know, Michael W. Smith and old school Hillsong and Jaws of Clay and Israel Helton and whatever you're into, right? You could program that thing again until Jesus comes back. And we would do it and just program hours of worship And just sit in this living room because we were like, God, there's more, there's more. We want more. I don't know if you've been around conversations like that, but but I'll tell you, as much as it drove my hunger, if I'm honest, there was something in me that became anxious as well. Because it started posing these questions where it's like, well, do I not have all of God? Do I, does, do I have less than this person? Do I, does this person have more than me? And in the flesh, I remember these conversations about more. It made me hungry, but it also made me kind of anxious where we would start ranking like who's the most spiritual and who has the most of the Holy Spirit. And I wonder if some of you guys have experienced that, the sense of like, well, what does that mean to have more? And here's what I've learned in this. I think we miss something here. You see, what I think we miss is that there is a third posture still of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about you know, pre-Pentecost in the Old Testament, the Spirit with us, like water with us. We use it to clean, refresh ourselves. And then post-Pentecost, it becomes the Spirit within us. It, it changes us. It transforms us. It, it, it grows us, sanctifies us, right? These two postures. But I want to suggest to us tonight that there is a deeper place still that God calls us into. A deeper, a third 
posture that if we're open to it, God wants to actually lead us into. And maybe I could illustrate it like this. Um, when, I was, when I was 17, I graduated high school. And me and some buddies, we were, we were young. We had, we had driver's licenses and too much testosterone, to be honest. And uh, so we decided to go on a trip. We, we wanted to go visit a friend of ours. And we were going to drive southeast coast of Australia um, to the city of Melbourne, and we were going to visit a lot of the beaches along the way. And every beach we liked, we were going to swim and body surf. And we didn't bring surfboards with us, but we, we were decent swimmers, and so we would body surf on any good waves. And I remember this one day as we were driving along this beautiful coast, and we find this beach, and it's pretty deserted. There might have been maybe three or four surfers out there, but the waves are huge. And it looks kind of kind of daunting, but we were like, man, we should get out there. Great ways. We, we should give this a go. And so we, we you know, against better judgment, we, we went out there and we were going to swim out to where the waves were breaking and, and just start body surfing. Well, as soon as we get in the water, we start to realize this was a bad idea. It got deep really quickly and there was a vicious undercurrent. And I, it, it just, I don't know if you've ever been in an undercurrent, like a rip an undertow before, it just began to violently pull us out into the ocean. And if you've ever been in a, in a rip before, you know all the wisdom is you don't fight it. You don't swim against it because you wear yourself out. What you do is you swim across it and then you swim back into the beach. Well, we knew that. We'd been taught that our whole lives as kids growing up in Australia. But all of that wisdom went out the window, and we just start paddling, right, as fast as we could. Every stroke I ever learned in swim class, we're just bringing it on. We're going to beat this undercurrent, but of course we can't. This thing is pulling us out further and further. Waves are smashing on us, and we're just getting pulled out into the ocean. And fortunately for us, a couple of surfers saw us, they paddle over to us and they kind of lift us onto their boards and bring us back into the sand and throw us, throw us on the beach. But I, I've thought about that, that moment um, a few times, especially how it kind of relates to what I'm talking about today. And, and I, I think there's a question that comes out of this story. And the question is this, who would you say was in control in that situation? Who was in control? And, and by that, what I mean is, would you say I was in control? Like little 150-pound, 17-year-old me who was doing all the wrong swim moves and making, would you say I was in control? Or would you say the enormity of the Pacific Ocean was in control? With its 700 million cubic kilometers, I looked it up, 700 million cubic kilometers of water and its massive towering waves and its unsearchable depths and, depth and its powerful rips and currents. Like, who would you say was in control? Because I can tell you what, as I was out there in the ocean, I did not feel like I was in control. The ocean was in control of me. It was pulling me wherever it wanted to go. If it wanted to throw a wave on me, that's what it was doing. If it wanted to pull me out further, it was pulling me out further. If it wanted to suck me under in the swell, it was sucking me under. i tell you who was in control, and it wasn't me. The ocean was in control, right? It, the, the truth of the matter is I didn't have the ocean. I didn't have the water. The water had me. The ocean had me. And guys, I think this story is helpful. This is, this is important, right? Stay with me on this because when it comes to this conversation about more, more of God, more of the Spirit, the question we often find ourselves asking is, do I have the Spirit? Do I have the Spirit? Do you have the Spirit? And I want to tell you tonight, that's the wrong question. It's absolutely the wrong question, right? If you are in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. All of it. Jesus says, poured out without measure. Not the Baptist spirit, not the, not the charismatic spirit, not the Dutch Reformed spirit, not the Australian spirit or the American spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. It is given over to you. Friends, the wrong question is, do you have the Spirit? The right question is, does the Spirit have you? 
does the Spirit have you? Has the Spirit grabbed a hold of your life and captivated your imagination? Has the Spirit directed you and and led you into unsearchable places? Has, has, has the Spirit grabbed hold of your passion and your dreams and your plans? Friends, there is no question that the Spirit is given over to you. We read about that at Pentecost. The question is, are you given over to the Spirit? Have you surrendered your life to the waves and the currents of the Holy Spirit to be led wherever God wants to lead you, to do whatever God wants to do with you? Or are you like me when I was 17 years old, just futilely just paddling against the enormity of God's purposes and plans for your life? Friends, we find ourselves asking a lot, do I have the Spirit? The question we should be asking ourselves is, does the Spirit have the Spirit? me have you released control guys you know what the opposite of of surrender is it's control it's control have you released that white knuckle grip we have on our lives and our plans and our futures and and our finances have we released that and said god whatever you want to do i am surrendering my life to your plan because there comes a moment for every single believer I'm saying believe a person who is already saved, who has confessed Jesus as Lord. There comes a moment where we have to answer the question, are you content? Are you satisfied to have the Spirit? Or are you willing to let the Spirit have you? Are you ready to give your life over to that? Friends, the third posture of this Holy Spirit, it's no longer just about the Spirit with you. And it's no longer even just about the Spirit within you. Now it's about you within the Spirit. A life completely surrendered to the work of the Holy Spirit, to the leading of His call, to His mission and His plan and His authority and power in your life. Guys, the the more that we are invited into is not more of the Spirit. It's it's more, it's not more Spirit, it's more surrender. That's what we bring. God provides the Spirit. We, We surrender our lives. We lean back literally into the waves and the ocean of His goodness and say, God, whatever you want to do with my life, do it with me. Use me for it. Lead me in it. You know, surrendering to the person of the Spirit equips us for the work of the Spirit. It's, it's, it's actually out of that place of intimacy, that place of, of surrender, of letting go, that we begin to walk not just in our fleshly, earthly authority in our best efforts, but we actually become empowered people. And, and guys, th- this is what we read about in Acts. Right? We read those verses, tongues of fire, spirit within them. Right? And, 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 and what happens is we read about this, this empowered, surrendered group of believers who then go out and literally change the world. And they'll go anywhere because they're completely given over to the work of the Spirit. They plant churches. Some of them are martyred and persecuted. They see signs and wonders. They they, they see huge conversions to the name of Jesus. They've given themselves over to the work of the Spirit. And guys, I want to suggest to us that not only is this the story of Acts, but in a lot of ways, this has been the story of our family of churches too. Honestly, I think the Grace family of churches has been defined by women and men surrendered to the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, and released into the work of the Spirit. And and whether that's looked like people moving to nations abroad to work amongst Muslim people, or people who have given their lives to disciple the next generation, and they've just poured into young women and men because they've given themselves over to the work of the Spirit, or people who have 
given their lives to plant churches, different churches around the country and around different nations in the world. This is what it has looked like. People surrendered to the work of the Spirit. I, I always remember, almost like it was yesterday, Pentecost 2014, which is when we gathered at the Tabernacle in Atlanta. I'm, I'm sure some of you were there. And Buddy Hoffman, our founder, was alive at that time. And he stood on that stage with, with 20 young people who were ready to move to D.C. to plant this church, Grace Capital City. And he said, I don't believe God's done yet. I don't believe God's done yet. And he turned around. He saw a group of people who were willing to say, I'll go. I'm not content to just have the Spirit. I want the Spirit to have me every single part of my life. And so that's the invitation for us. You have the Spirit. If you're in Jesus, you have the Spirit. But the question is, does the Spirit have you? And so we wanted to create an opportunity for just some response here. And we know different people are watching this in different ways. I know there's some of you who are gathered in living rooms and small watch parties. And so there's going to be some prompts and some questions coming on the screen. But maybe together in that room, you can pray for one another. Pray for that spirit of surrender. Pray for that, those places that you've white nickel, knuckle grip that you need to let go of. For some of you, you might be watching on your own. But there's still that same work, that same invitation, that same moment to surrender afresh to God's leading. Guys, and I'll just leave you with this. God's vision for your life is better than your vision for your life. Surrendering to God's vision for your life is the best decision you can ever make. Go in peace. If it's true that heaven's open, let my heart be open too. I want to feel the wind blowing, be more sensitive to you.
So we'd love to close with some prompts into mission. As Chris said, as we surrender to the Holy Spirit, He leads us into mission. So we have a few questions. The first is, how is the Holy Spirit leading you into mission with Him? The second one is just to ask again, will you financially partner with us in our shared mission as a family of churches? This is how we feel the Spirit is leading us, and we're asking you to join us in that. Another prompt is just to go outside to see what's out there as you walk around. What do you see? Who do you see? How might God be leading you to have conversations with your neighbors? How might God be calling you to serve those right around you? So we're going to have these prompts scroll on the screen now, and that prayer is going to come back up. You can even take a, a screenshot on your phone of those prompts and of the prayer, and we hope this uh, lead you into some fresh expressions of mission today. And as you pray this prayer and meditate on this, just be open to the unexpected ways God might prompt you um, to reach out, to speak about Him, to serve those right around you. Thanks so much for joining us on this Pentecost 2020, and we'll see you guys next week.
Hey GCC, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Just a reminder, we're offering both prayer and breakout rooms tonight immediately following service. If you'd like to join, you can do so by clicking the links below, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can find those links in the video description. We hope to see you there.